Hi, everyone. Good afternoon. Thank you for joining me for the uh, open house for AP Chemistry Prep for this spring 2024 semester. Okay, so we will go ahead and get started. This is going to be um, around an hour, but I will reserve the last several minutes so that I can take questions. I know last year I had students from all over the United States, so I'm I'm curious if you can type in where you're from. I see Boston, Massachusetts. Oh, it's it's a lot colder up there than it is down here. Okay, Pittsburgh. Oh, we have someone else from the Houston area. So it's looking like several people from the East Coast and then maybe a couple from the Houston area as well. I'm so glad y'all are here today. And I look forward to working with your students, or if you are a student joining, I look forward to working with you as well. All right. So I'll start with just a little bit about me. I My name is Lauren Stutz. I have been teaching for 10 years now. I teach chemistry. I have taught here in public schools in the Houston area. So I started in the Houston Independent School District. I was there for about five years. I then headed over to a different district in the Houston area. And I am currently teaching at the Kincaid School here in Houston, Texas. I have taught chemistry the entire time. I've done both on-level, pre-AP, AP. So I've taught a little bit of everything. Um, in addition to teaching chemistry, I also am an adjunct professor at one of the community colleges in the area, though I don't teach chemistry there, I teach physics. Um, finally, just this past year, I actually obtained my national board teaching certification in chemistry. It is not something that's required. It is an advanced certification. Um, it was always a goal of mine just to better myself and my teaching practices. And I grew and I learned a lot through that. And I'll be excited to apply some of those when I am teaching this AP chemistry prep class this spring. The AP chemistry exam prep is a review class. So there is an expectation that any student who is in the course has already taken chemistry. It's all right if it isn't pre-AP chemistry. So if perhaps a school did not offer that and they were in on-level or regular chemistry, prep chemistry, that's all right. Um, I can help fill in some of those gaps, but there is a requirement that students need to have taken chemistry prior to being in this course. Now, this is going to run from February 4th to April 28th, and then the current plan is that there will be no class on March 10th. Um, that is going to be the spring break, our spring break here in Houston, Texas. So we try to follow what the other schools in the area are doing. This will also be from 12 to 2 in the afternoon, so every Sunday. And I know if you're on the East Coast, that might be even better because you'll get pushed back a little bit in terms of time. If somebody comes from the West Coast, it'll be an early morning. But this class is designed to prepare students for the AP chemistry exam, which will be coming up in early May. This, well, AP chemistry in general is considered to be an, basically an intro to chemistry, but at the college level. It is a rigorous course. Um, it's quite challenging. It's one of the more challenging AP courses that is offered just across the United States. I think AP chemistry and AP physics are probably the most difficult. So having this time set aside every week specifically to focus on AP chemistry is incredibly important. So not only are students seeing material in class and they're learning material in class, but I will be able to supplement what they are learning. So I'm not replacing their teacher, but I'm helping to further their understanding, 
And hopefully we'll all kind of be in a similar place and I'm not teaching or going over material before a student has learned it. Obviously that is gonna depend on the particular school um, in which your student attends or the teacher they have, but the goal is that I'm supplementing the things they're already learning in class. This and AP Chemistry in general explores four big ideas and those are proportion and quantity, structure and the properties of substances, transformations and energy. And AP Chemistry goes pretty deeply into each of those topics, um, though each one does cover a large range of material. There will be homework in this class. Um, it should take somewhere between 45 to 90 minutes. It just sort of depends on the student's level of, of understanding. I will have multiple choice questions and I will also have free response questions, which I will grade and will provide individualized feedback to students throughout the week. So I hope that every student in the class will take advantage of this, this time to continue practicing. Now the AP chemistry exam, is, it's a pretty long exam. It lasts around four hours from beginning to end. There are, and that includes breaks, that includes everything. So around three, hours and 15 minutes, that's going to be how much time students have to answer all of the questions. So three hours and 15 minutes. You can imagine that at the beginning, things are generally going pretty smoothly. And towards the end, it can be difficult to just stay focused and, and make it through. But that's why I'm here again, to help supplement what they are learning in class and to help each student feel incredibly confident in the material so that we can avoid that, that uh, exhaustion that comes with just thinking for three and a half hours. This exam is scored like every other AP exam. It is a scale of one to five with the goal being that every student gets a five. So a one would be a failing score. And while a two isn't a failing score, it also doesn't count for college credit, if a student receives a two, you would need anywhere from a three to a five in order to receive a passing score and for a college or university to accept that credit. Now, some universities now actually don't even accept a three. Students need to get a four or a five in order for the college to accept that particular exam as credit for the course. This is a curved exam and students need only need to get about 75% of the material correct in order to earn a five. So there is a pretty big curve that, um, that is generally given on the AP exam just because of the difficulty of the questions and the, the breadth of the material covered. All right, so now I'm, I'll mention a little bit about the breakdown of the exam. And I'm sure students have heard this from their own AP Chemistry teachers, but there are two sections in the AP Chemistry exam. We have our multiple choice section, which students receive an hour and a half to answer 60 questions. So they are answering these questions at a pretty rapid speed. Um, they are not allowed a calculator for this portion of the exam. So the, the math is generally, I would say it's easier because it's often something that can be done in your head. For the uh, multiple choice portion. Now, the free response section is one hour and 45 minutes long. There's only seven questions that are in this section, but as you can imagine, if there's only seven questions, they're really long questions. So it might be one that is five parts. So it might have an A, B, C, D, and E. 
and all of the parts will connect together in some form or fashion. Sometimes those free response questions are asking for an explanation. Other times it's a fairly quick answer like an electron configuration. And then other times you actually have to work out a pretty detailed math problem, but all of those are gonna be found in the free response section. Again, seven questions, three are considered long questions and four are considered shorter questions. And those longer questions are worth more points. Each section is worth 50% of the total score. So one section is not weighted more than another. This year's exam date is gonna be May 6th. So pretty, pretty early in May, uh, for the exam. Now, the free response section, as I mentioned, those are often more difficult simply because there isn't an option to eliminate answers and then just sort of guess at the end to provide an educated guess. You really have to know something about each topic in order to even make an, educate, an educated guess in the free response section. So I always encourage students to take advantage of the homework that I assign for the free response questions. Um, honestly, that's probably the, the homework that students often decide not to do. Many of them decide they wanna do the multiple choice questions because it's faster, um, but to just sort of ignore the free response questions, or perhaps they're working them on their own time because I do post answer keys afterwards, but a lot of them don't take advantage of the individualized feedback that I'm able to provide to each student. Or even if a student needs to ask additional questions through Canvas, which is how we communicate with the students and host the classes. Um, so I really, really encourage students to take advantage of the free response homework for each unit. There are nine general units which cover all of the topics in AP chemistry. So we have atomic structure and properties and we have molecular and ionic compound structures and properties, so they, they do split those up. Then we move into intermolecular forces and chemical reactions and kinetics. So there's, there's an order and there's a flow to how each of these units is connected. I would definitely consider these first five units to be a little bit easier than the final four, which are thermodynamics, equilibrium, acids and bases, and then applications of thermodynamics. The good news is there are lots of practice questions for each of these topics, each of these units, and each topic within the unit. I have both multiple choice prep and free response prep, and then we'll go over general notes during class as well. I thought it would be fun to just share the score distributions from last year's AP exams. You'll you'll notice that um, AP chemistry actually just slightly had the highest percentage of students earning a three or more on the exam. This is not because the AP chemistry exam is easier than the others. Uh, it definitely has to do with the amount of prep that students are doing for this class or how seriously they're taking the AP exam. But this is the general score distribution. So very few students actually earn a one. It's fairly difficult to do if you know your basics. About double that, so 16%. Managed to score a five, but you'll see the largest percentage were that three and four range, which is still wonderful. Um, a four counts pretty much anywhere. It's it's that three range that we want to try to bump 
more students from that three to the four in hopes that whatever university the student has been accepted into will still accept the class um, and the, they don't have to take it over again unless they just choose to. But it is very challenging to earn a four or a five on the AP Chem exam. We will use Zoom for all classes. And we will use Canvas to share all class material. The link to join class will always be found on the homepage. It's very obvious. It says join your class live. So it's pretty difficult to miss. I believe at this point, most students have quite a bit of practice using Canvas just because so many schools have transitioned from whatever system they were using before to using Canvas. But if a student is not familiar with how to use Canvas, I will be happy to work with that individual student to just make sure they, they know how to navigate the platform. You can see over here on the, the side, oh, let's see. Um, on the left side, you'll see we have announcements, assignments, grades. So in the assignments, the students will be able to, to find all of the homework. That's where it will be located, both the free response and the multiple choice. And should I need to make any important announcements, uh, for example, if we have a weather event that causes power outages and class needs to be rescheduled, I will post an announcement here. And then grades can be found where it says grades up here, right there. And those will just have feedback. So please remember grades are feedback. If a student earns a five out of 10 on the multiple choice homework, that's an indicator that the student did not fully understand that topic and more work is needed. Whereas maybe they earned an eight out of 10 on another topic and that's good. And eight out of 10 does show mastery. There can still be improvement, but that's not where the student's focus would need to be. They, it would need to be on the homework where a five out of 10 was scored so that we can bring everything up to that eight out of 10 level, which would translate to a four on the AP exam. And that would be awesome. All right. Now here in modules is where a student can access everything together. So if the student is just looking for assignments, they can go to the assignments tab that I pointed out earlier. But if they want to see everything, including the notes and the filled in notes. So I will post blank notes and then I will post them after we have filled them in once class is over. So the students can access the notes, the key to the notes, and then any homework that is posted there as well. So the homework can be accessed in multiple ways on Canvas. I will also post the recording of the lesson or the review after it has been completed. It does take a little bit of time. So if a student had to miss for any reason, please don't expect that five minutes after class ends, the recording will be ready. It does take several minutes for the recording to finish processing, and then we have to upload it um, and make it available for viewing. So by about 3 p.m. Central Time, uh, the recording should be up live and actually ready to go. And you can click on it and it will work. Prior to that, it might not be done processing yet. The Canvas invite links will be sent around four to five days before the actual start of class. So because we're not starting until February 4th, you should be students, students will receive the email, not parents, students next week or the week after, most likely the week after, just before the class is ready to begin. And then everything posted in Canvas will be available for three months after the last day of class. So then students would have access until um, July. 
All right. So now I wanted to go through a few sample questions just to give you an idea of my teaching style. I think it's important that parents get to experience what the children do um, so that you can see just how I intend to present material to students. And I'm going to see. So let me read it first, and then I'm going to open another doc document to actually type in. It says to answer the following question about the substances CO, so carbon monoxide, chlorine gas, and COCl2. This is a multi-part question, and I believe in this one we're going to have, yeah, A, B, C, and D, and you'll see how they all flow together. So for part A, it tells us in the boxes below, complete the Lewis electron dot diagrams for each molecule by drawing all of the bonding and non-bonding electron pairs. Each atom should obey the octet rule in the diagram for COCl2. The formal charge on each atom should be equal to zero. So even in the instructions for part A, they've given us a couple of reminders, which is incredibly helpful and honestly very kind that the people who make the exam do this. So I'm going to just pull up. Nah, this is a good color. I'll use this. Okay, so it says we have the molecule CO, Cl2, so it was CO, Cl2, and CO, Cl2. And it gave us the basic structure of each molecule, which is also quite helpful. So we don't have to guess at which atom goes in the middle, even though that's generally pretty obvious, especially if a carbon is present. Okay, so the first thing we should do when deciding how each of these should be drawn. Number one, let's look at the valence electrons that each atom has. So we're going to start over here with molecule CO, carbon monoxide. Hopefully, the students have this committed to memory at this point. If not, they can refer back to the periodic table. So carbon has four valence electrons, and I'll write this here, valence electrons. Oxygen has six valence electrons. And if we add that up, that's a total of 10 valence electrons. So this particular molecule is able and must have 10 electrons in the structure. So there's three possible ways that we could draw a molecule containing two atoms. We could use a single bond, a double bond, or a triple bond. When we're doing this, no matter which one we end up using, we're going to have to make sure each of those two atoms has eight electrons because it said they must obey the octet rule. So nothing is going to be breaking the octet rule this time. Well, carbon, because there's one bond, has two electrons. So it needs two, four, six more to get to eight. And oxygen needs the same. So I'm just going to fill all of these in and then we'll go back and look at them. If there is a double bond, carbon and oxygen each have four electrons because there's two electrons per bond. So that would be four additional on each. And if carbon and oxygen both have a triple bond, then they have six electrons already and they each need two more. So between these three, we're just going to check and determine which allows us to meet our rule of having 10 valence electrons total. So let's count them. This is right here is 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12, 14. There's 14 electrons, so we know that this cannot be right. We need 10. In this next one, we have 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12. That's 12. That can't be right either leaving us with only one option, two, four, six, eight, ten. This is correct. So our final drawing looks like this with a triple bond. Now for chlorine, we're going to use the same idea. So chlorine each has seven electrons, uh, valence electrons, and there are two chlorines. So that's going to be 14 valence total. 
Again, we have three ways we could possibly do this. But this time, instead of doing all three, I'm just going to start with the first. And if we need to continue moving to double and triple bonds, we will. So chlorine, let's try a single bond. That's two electrons for each chlorine. So I'm going to add six more. So that's two, four, six, eight, 10, 12, 14. Ah, well, that one was nice because it was a single bond. And we don't need to do anything else. We have 14 electrons, which is exactly what our number said we should have. And the final one is COCl. Now, one of the rules that students are taught in chemistry is that carbon loves to bond with other atoms. In fact, if it can form four bonds, it almost always does. The only reason it didn't for carbon monoxide is because it couldn't, there was not another atom for it to bond with. Because carbon likes to form four bonds, we know that one of these is gonna have to be a double bond. And the element most likely to form a double bond is always oxygen, in this case, between carbon and oxygen. So even though when it was by itself with oxygen, it formed a triple bond, that is no longer possible because we have two chlorine atoms in our structure instead of just one. And I'm gonna take some of this away. All right, so double. And if those are if that's my double bond, then the carbon and chlorine are gonna have to have single bonds. Then we're gonna go back and fill in the lone electrons wherever they're needed. So this chlorine down here currently has two electrons in the bond. So we have to add six more. And the same to this other chlorine because there's a little bit of symmetry there. And up here we have four electrons on oxygen. So I'll add four more to make eight. And on this carbon in the middle, we have two, four, six, eight. So we don't need to do anything else. Now, the last thing we will confirm is that we have the number of electrons that we need. So carbon, we already know had four valence electrons, oxygen six, fluorine at seven, and that's times two. So that's 14 plus six is 20, plus four is 24 electrons. Okay, let's just verify. And I'm gonna choose another color to do this part. Um, let's use just use black. So 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12, 14, 16, 18, 20, 22, 24. Yes, it does. So that checks out. Now, there was one more instruction in the prompt, and it said all atoms must have no formal charge or zero, a formal charge of zero. So let's verify that that is, in fact, true. And formal charge is gonna be the valence electrons minus the bonding electrons plus any lone pairs of electrons or lone electrons. Let's write it like that so we can count them individually. Okay, so let's do this first for carbon. Or yeah, we'll just start with carbon in the middle. Carbon has four valence electrons. So that's four minus. Now we need the bonding electrons. Carbon has four bonding electrons because in one bond, the electrons are being shared. So carbon is bringing one of those electrons to the table each time. So that's one, two, three, four. So that's four. And then the lone electrons, carbon has no lone electrons. So four minus four is zero. This is good because we needed no charge. Let's check oxygen. Oxygen has six valence electrons minus. So the bonding is gonna be one, two. And there are four lone electrons. Six minus six is also zero. And let's check it for chlorine. Chlorine has seven valence minus. Okay, it brings one bonding electron to the table and then six lone electrons. So that's seven minus seven. And this other chlorine is going to be the same because it is identical to the one on the other side.
Awesome. So we have all three of these drawn. Okay, so now we're going to go look at part two. I'll be answering it right here, but I'm going to go read the question. So that was a little bit longer. It took more time. This next one should be very fast, though. So although the atoms in the Lewis diagram for the carbon monoxide molecule obey the octet rule, the charge on each atom is not zero. Based on the Lewis diagram for CO that you drew, calculate the formal charge of each atom. So part B is connected to part A. So if a student had missed something in part A, they would have likely missed it in part B as well. Unless the hint, the formal charge on each atom is not zero, told them that they needed to go back and look at their um, work. So we drew CO like this. And we're just going to check the charges for each of these. So we'll start with carbon. Carbon has four valence electrons. And we're going to see how many of everything else it has. So it has one, two, three bonding electrons, plus the two lone electrons here. So four minus five is negative one. There's a minus one charge on carbon here. Now let's check it for oxygen. So that's six minus, okay, one, two, three, plus one, two. That's going to give oxygen a charge of positive one. So there's our formal charges on carbon and on oxygen, a negative one and a positive one. That part was pretty quick, and that's part B. Part C is also pretty quick. So here's part C. It says, fill in the missing information in the table below, this time for the COCl2 molecule. Okay, all of this is, is a lot of memorization, so students would need to have to already know the various molecular geometries, um, how to count sigma and pi bonds, et cetera. And then this question's pretty straightforward. So the first part asked for the molecular geometry. Well, if we take a look at the molecule we drew, which looked like this, and I won't worry about the lone electron pairs on the outer atoms right now, so for molecular geometry, we need to look at the central atom, which in our case is this carbon. And we need to note how many bonds it forms and then how many lone pairs of electrons it has. So looking at the carbon, I see there are no lone pairs of electrons and the three bonds have been formed. So this double bond up here is gonna count as one, so a double bond and then two single bonds, so that's three. Which means the only molecular geometry this could possibly be is trigonal planar. Because we have two chlorines, which are quite electronegative, down here, and then we have an oxygen, which is a little bit less electronegative. This is going to be a polar molecule, even though it has a trigonal planar geometry. If all of these outer atoms, so if they were all oxygens or all chlorines, then this would be nonpolar, but because they are different, there is going to be uh, a slight pull toward, towards the chlorines. The last two questions are asking about the number of sigma and pi bonds. So how many sigma bonds are in this molecule and how many pi bonds are in this molecule? Anytime we see a single bond, we know there is a sigma bond. And anytime we see a double bond, there is both a sigma and a pi. So for sigma, we would have one here, one here, and then one there. So that's three sigma bonds. And for the pi bond, we're just going to have one from this double bond. So again, that part was a little bit more just do you know this information, just recall. So with our final 15-ish minutes, if you have a question you'd like to ask about how the course works, about the homework assignments, or just anything in general, 
I'm happy to answer it. If you do not have any questions, you don't have to keep sitting here. You are welcome to go on about your day. Um, should you need to contact Momentum Learning, this is their website. They do have an office phone and an email. If a student needs to contact me, that will be done through the Canvas platform, which they will have access to fairly soon, just in about two weeks, a little less than two weeks. So again, if you don't have questions, please feel free to go on about your day. You can log off, but if you do, I'll stay behind and answer them until 1 p.m. Okay, let's see, I see some people typing things in the chat. The class is two hours every Sunday from February 4th until the week just before the AP exam. I believe that's April 30th. Um, let me see. April 28th. So February 4th to April 28th. And that is from 12 to 2 p.m. And then homework, homework is never ever meant to take over an hour and a half. Though the amount of time any particular student will spend on homework is very much dependent on their level of understanding of that particular topic. So if they understand something really well, they might knock the homework out in 30 minutes. Whereas a topic that they're not as confident in, it might take them upwards of 90 minutes. But if it's taking more than 90 minutes, I would rather them stop and then ask questions in the next class or contact me in Canvas so that I can assist and they're not sitting there staring at the problems um, and just not getting anywhere. Yes, yes, there is going to be overlap. So this is not meant to be a class where I'm teaching new material. The person, or the teacher for each student is going through all of this material. And then I am here to reinforce and, and yes, as you said, to complement what is being done in their classes. So now that they've learned it, we're gonna practice just really application and do they know how to work through the problems? Do they know how to how to identify what is being asked in each question. Oftentimes, I would say it's more difficult to figure out what is being asked um, on the multiple choice section because the free response, as you, as you saw, it lays everything out nicely. Oh, we're drawing in this one. We're calculating the delta H. We are figuring out the molecular geometry. But sometimes it can be difficult to decipher on the multiple choice section what is being asked. But yes, we'll be complementing the material that's already being covered in class. And I'll answer, I'm going to answer this one too. So I had a private question asked, but it perhaps somebody else has this question as well. Okay, so um, my I do have another question. Do I mainly teach during the class or is it problem solving based? I will do a little of both. So I will review the material that is generally covered in this lesson or in a unit. So for example, if we're doing a unit on kinetics, there's a lot of information covered in there. So I will review with the students the basics of that unit just to help them remember. I will identify any common misconceptions or uh, common issues that I see when students approach kinetics in general in chemistry. And then we will also be working problems throughout the class. So sometimes if it's a really challenging problem, I might just walk the students through it and then offer a second problem where I give students a few minutes to try it on their own. And then we talk about it together as a class. So the goal is that this is an interactive class and the students are practicing while we're in class and they're communicating with me. They're asking questions. They're responding to my questions. And if we ever go into breakout rooms, which we do sometimes so that students can talk to each other about the questions that they are actively participating and not just sitting there quietly working, that they're talking to whoever they're in a group with. So we'll do both. That was also a great question. 
the accuracy rate for a student to earn a five is generally answering around 75% of questions correctly. So because the AP exam gives a curve, which is different every year, just depending on what the averages are for a particular year, around 75% must be correct, give or take a little bit, depending on the year. Uh, and then even if a class is supposed to run alongside an AP class at school, is it possible to take this class without it? It is possible to take this class without it. Um, I had a student who did that last year. He found the material to be significantly more challenging because I would be reviewing things that he had never seen before. So not only was he attempting to keep up here, but he was having to learn the material fresh. I mean, he had never, never seen it before. So it is possible, but it does require significantly more work than somebody who has seen this material before. Um, is the person in question, have they taken chemistry before or do you mean that they're taking this AP course while taking chemistry for the first time? Oh, if you've already taken chemistry and you're not in AP chemistry, but you're hoping to take the exam, I think that that will be fine. Because you've seen all the material before, you may just need um, some refreshers, and then you will see some things that you probably did not learn in your class. But I don't know, maybe your teacher went more into depth than what teachers generally do in, an, in a pre-AP or honors level class. Okay, I think I think y'all don't have any questions, so I just want to say thank you so much for coming, um, and I look forward to teaching uh, either you or your your students, depending on whether you're a student or parent right now. Uh, I look forward to seeing you in a couple of weeks if you are a student. Have a wonderful rest of your Sunday.